Hey friends, hope you're doing well. I figured I'd come out here, feed the squirrels, and talk to the people. And uh, I was reading an interview with Paul Simon in the Times. This was published, I think, last weekend. And uh, really good interview, really good. Some the it's written by um, Dan Cairns. He went to uh, Paul Simon's ranch in Texas, which was one of the big reveals to begin with. Was uh, Paul Simon no longer lives in New York. He lives on a ranch in Texas. He said it had his wife Edie Burkell is from there and uh, he didn't want to be in the cold anymore. He's reached that point in his life. Doesn't want any cold weather. I hope he doesn't mind 100 degree weather. It's a really good interview, but the biggest takeaway is him talking about his hearing loss. He's got a new album out and uh, he's kind of talking about the writing of those. He said the lyrics came after the guitar pieces many of them in dreams from which Simon would wake in the small hours to jot them down later. Painstakingly, he worked on bringing them together. The early part of the process coincided with a life-changing moment. Quite suddenly, I lost most of the hearing in my left ear and nobody has an explanation for it. So everything became more difficult. My reaction to that was frustration and annoyance. Not quite anger yet because I thought it would pass it would repair itself. That's um, a scary thing. I'm curious if any of you guys suffer from hearing loss. I've had problems with tinnitus over the years and um, I'm not, I don't have a bad case. Mine, it sounds like I always hear crickets in the background, like a field of crickets. It's very dull and in the background, uh, this monotone thing, but I always hear it. When I go in to interview someone, one of the first things I do is just listen to see if the room is quiet, if there's anything obvious that needs to be turned off. And if it's completely silent, all I will hear is this, these cricket type sounds. And, um, and then I'll ask the person I'm interviewing, do you hear that? And they say no. And then I know that it's quiet in there. Luckily for me, that's not an unpleasant sound. So I can only imagine people, and I hear it right now, I hear it all the time, but I can only imagine people who have hearing loss that's some kind of a frequency that's really annoying and grating and it never going away. It's 24 hours a day, that's a rough thing to deal with. And uh, mine's from loud amplifiers and rather attending shows, working in a bar or playing, you know, through amplifiers and such. But um, I can only imagine, you know, what it would be like to just completely lose the hearing in, in one ear. But um, that's, what, that's what Paul Simon's dealing with right now. He says, um, it says that he thought that it would pass and it would repair itself, but it is yet to do so, which makes any prospect of a return to live performance extremely dim. Perhaps Simon muses, that's not a bad thing. Uh, Paul Simon says, the songs of mine that I don't want to sing live, I don't sing them. Sometimes there are songs that I like, and then at a certain point in the tour, I'll say, what the hell are you doing, Paul? Quite often that would come during You Can Call Me Al. Uh, I'd think, what are you doing? Uh, you're like a Paul Simon cover band. You should get off the road and go home. Um, <laughs> I guess Paul Simon does not like to play Can Call Me Al anymore. I'll be honest, I might be the only person, but if I went to see Paul Simon live and he didn't do You Can Call Me Al, I wouldn't mind. That's all right. Of, of my favorite Paul Simon songs, and there are many, that one's way low on the list for me. Not that I dislike it, but... Um, and to say he feels like a Paul Simon cover band it's like those are your songs man you earned it play them if you want if you want to he's got enough great songs he could drop a few off the list and i think people would be all right with it and the interviewer chimes in and he says uh, uh listening to wait the final song on seven psalms which is the uh paul simon's new album seven psalms um, it dawns on you that the whole album has been leading to this point the realization came to Simon too as he was working on the song and it hit him hard. 
So wait, the first verse goes, I'm not ready, I'm just packing my gear. Wait, my hand's steady, my mind is still clear. His wife duets with him in the final passage. Heaven is beautiful, it's almost like home. Children get ready, it's time to come home. It ends with a harmonized amen and tolling bells. The effect is shattering. You can almost sense the drawing of a final breath. And Paul Simon says, um, it's a spooky thing to be writing something and just be thinking, oh, this is what the song needs. And then Simon says, as his eyes fill with tears, and then it's, by the way, this is about you. You're actually the subject of this. And then he pauses. He says, it's just the age we're at. Gordon Lightfoot just passed away. Jeff Beck too. My generation's time is up. That's Paul Simon. And the interviewer closes it by saying, maybe and yet two days after we meet, Paul Simon will sit down with drummer Steve Gadd to work on a new song. Even as the clock ticks, he's still creating after all these years. Uh, Seven Psalms is out now. Um, isn't that really the way life should be? And Paul Simon has all of the good things in life, the money to live on a ranch in Texas and all of that, but um, he loves music and he can feel the end drawing near so he's doing what he enjoys and what he you know what br brings him joy he's making music you know right till the end i think that's great i think that's absolutely great but um i do feel for i've met so many people with hearing problems and most of it through music or being around loud music that i i empathize when i hear those stories and the pete townsend thing didn't i see uh a headline that Pete Townsend believes his uh, hearing is is turning around and getting better. Am I imagining that? I need to Google that and see if that's uh, true. I just now thought of that. I He's one of the more legendary people with hearing problems. I have a hard time hearing um, like faint voices. And uh, if I'm in a, like if I go to a restaurant or something and there's a lot of background noise a lot of people talking or music in the background and then someone starts speaking to me I have a really hard time telling what they're saying I have to really lean in and try to concentrate and I can't always hear what they're saying to me I can't make it out especially if it's a woman's voice um, you know just softer and it blends in a little bit more a man's voice sometimes is just louder and harsher and cuts through a little more. But uh, I have a serious problem with that. And um, when I'm placing an order, different places I have to lean in and hear. You know, I'm lucky I don't have horrible hearing loss, but I definitely have some. And uh, and it's a drag. I'm curious what you guys are dealing with. Have you had any of the, the prescription earbuds, you know, or stuff like that? The, I used to wear the foam that you scrunch up and you would stick in your ears. I used to wear those um, at shows and stuff, but they just cut out all the high end and it just sounds really muffled and bad. And sometimes the show would be so loud, you just go ahead and do that. But, uh, you know, other times, like, I want to hear what's going on. I want to hear some kind of a representation. And I guess too many nights like that leads to bad hearing. But, um, What's your favorite Paul Simon stuff? Tell me, tell me down in the comments. I want to hear that. I want to hear your, I, I could listen to the boxer over and over and over again. I've never gotten tired of that. I've never gotten tired of the only living boy in New York. And I never heard anyone talk about that forever. And then I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, people started talking about that all the time. I can only assume it was uh, used in a movie or something. You know, sometimes something happens like that and a whole lot more people know about a song. That's what I'm assuming happened. And I'm gonna, you're gonna tell me, yeah, that's what happened. And, and I'm gonna feel bad that I haven't seen that movie. But um, what are your Paul Simon stuff? If you put on something right now, what would be your go-to? So I got a question from Charles Acuna. And if you want to ask me questions, leave me questions down below and I'll try to answer some of them. But he says, talk about Grant's showbiz. 
Um, did he mention Marky e. Smith or the fall? And I'm guessing that Charles knows that um, I'm that I know Grant from uh, touring with Billy Bragg, and um, man, Grant is just great. He's a beautiful, beautiful cat, and uh, him and Billy both absolutely love both of them. But um, Grant talked about the fall a little bit, but I was mostly asking him about just Smith stories and stuff like that. And um, we actually recorded an episode of my podcast, a couple of episodes. Um, I think that we talked about the Smiths in uh, some of that, where Grant was, uh, he produced their records. He produced a lot of Billy's records. And when I was touring with Billy, he um, was touring as Billy's sound man. So he would run sound each night. And I remember one night in Triorchy, Wales, he was just like, I'm gonna run sound for you tonight, Otis. And I'm like, hell yeah, let's do this. And uh, that was actually my favorite uh, night of the whole tour. Um, in this beautiful old theater built by miners way back when, the Park and Dare Theater. And uh, I'll get sidetracked. I'll come back to the question at hand, but I remember, um, I think I've shared this before. I don't know if I've shared this on the channel, but there was some kind of a problem with me getting paid that night. And uh, they knew it was gonna happen like before the show even started. But we went up, um, I believe it was upstairs. Our green room area was an old room and there were these old tea um, cups sitting around, a lot of old tea cups. And um, they had like squirrels on them, like uh, patterns, little bitty cute tea cups with squirrels on them, birds, rabbits, you know, they looked very like somebody's grandma had them and I thought they were great. I just thought they were really cool. So when the people from the theater came back and they were trying, it was very serious. They were like, we're sorry, Otis, but we, uh, we don't have a, um, how, how can we pay you? They're trying to figure out the way to make this happen. And, um, and I don't really care. I'm just like, I'm having such a good time. And uh, the money's the last thing I'm thinking about. I'm just like, can you just like transfer it to my checking account or something to my account? And if it takes two months, it takes two months. And um, so they're like, yeah, we can do that. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, the only stipulation that I have, and the whole room's getting really serious, is Billy and Grant and uh, you know all, of, all these people sitting around waiting for me to be a jerk, I guess, wondering if I'm gonna be a jerk about it. And I'm just being a little bit serious. I said, well, I'll tell you what, um, I'll go along with all of this um, on one condition. And then there's a big pause as the tension enters the room. And I said, if you're willing to throw in one of these teacups uh, that I can take with me, um, I'll go ahead and do that. And then everybody started laughing. <laughs> and they said, you can have as many of these teacups as you want. And I said, oh, really? So I took, there was a set of six different ones with the squirrel and different poses, um, the rabbit and all that. And I wrapped them up in my socks, in my um, like work boot socks. I had big thick socks in. It was the winter, and um, put them all in my backpack and uh, carried them all the way back home. And um, Billy and Grant and Andy, they all just gave me a hard time. The rest of the tour, saying I've seen a lot of things in this business, but I've never seen anybody negotiate teacups into the settlement. And um, but I did, and I still have some of those in there. I brought them home to Amy. They all survived coming home, and that's been, I don't know, 10, at least 10 years. It might have been 15 years since then, and um, a few of them have broken when they're being washed, but we have a couple of them left. I believe the squirrel ones are left in there. And Amy still has tea um, from them. I brought them to her as well. I thought she would love them is why I wanted them. And, um, but that was my favorite gig of that tour. He talked about the fall a little bit. Um, just that they, they were a blast and they were great. You know, the fall was a great band. I don't remember any of the stories in particular and I feel bad about that. 
I do remember um, remember asking Grant how uh, I never remember the name of the, the song um, the Smith song um, where is now how, how long is now or something that song you know I'm human and I want to be loved I'm asking like what's going on with that intro what how exactly is that all being done when you record when you're recording that because it's such a great guitar track with that you know that tremolo on the amp it's just so great sounding or vibrato it sounds so cool and um he said that um johnny marr played through two fender amps i thought he said twins but i don't remember and they had the tremolo set. Now this is back in more analog times. Now you can buy a pedal, and when you hear like Crimson and Clover, you know, wah, 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 when it going in beat, things like that, or um, you can just, there's a tap tempo pedal that you hit with your foot. So you like count it off, one, two, three, four, along with the tempo of the song, and then it starts playing exactly that tempo. They didn't have that then, so they're actually using the amp. And Grant, Grant said they used two different amps that were mic'd up, and he was in front of one of them, and another cat was in front of the other, and they're monitoring the drum beat, and they are slightly turning, just slightly turning the, uh, um, the speed on the tremolo to keep it in time with the record so that those two amps are right on the beat. And uh, it sounds great, and they pan them out, and it's just a great, huge sound, and um, a great, great track. And uh, like the first time I ever heard that, like on MTV maybe, I just remember, like, what is going on? That's the coolest damn guitar thing. You know, as a guy who likes, you know, the old amp tremolos. And, uh, I remember that story. I remember him saying he was in the control room when they broke up and uh, just as it all is kind of coming down. I believe that I recorded him talking about that on uh, on the podcast. Thanks for giving a damn. Look up some of those old episodes on there. It's been so many years I have a hard time remembering, but, um, but I believe he talked about the breakup and being there in the moment and, and all of that. And he also, uh, what else? Oh, so I'm in, a, I'm in a van, like a Sprinter van, with Billy and uh, Andy and Pete and, and Grant for a month, you know? I mean, a month. Every day you're riding and then you're in a venue and you're around these people for long periods of time. And you can be on your best behavior. You know, we all try to be on our best behavior and be, you know, we all just try to be nice people or whatever. But when you're around somebody that long, you can't keep it up. So you just kind of end up being who you are. You can't really fake it. And man, they're just wonderful people. Like really, some of, it was one of the most positive experiences I've ever had in music was being around them and, um, and Billy leading by like no matter how uncomfortable and how tired and worn out from the tour he was. He'd get up every morning, get, you know, get in the van with two different newspapers, read them front to back with a smile, tell a joke, laugh, and he's like leading by example. We like doing this. We're lucky enough to get to do this. We're gonna enjoy doing this. You know, just making that choice at the beginning of the day. No, this is what we've always wanted to do and we're doing it. And I can relate to that in ways that is hard to describe. And it's not out here, none of the stupid chasing women, getting loaded and all of that. It's just, you know, grown ups trying to put on the best damn show they possibly can for the people who pay their money to see it and then walk out and meet whoever wants to meet you and trying to be you know, just there for them in that moment and uh, let the people who are paying the money know how much you appreciate that you get to do this, you know. So it was a wonderful experience. It was so nice to see that side because you always, 
everybody acts like that's where they are, but then here's a group of people who live that. You know, it's a very punk rock thing. It's they come from a punk rock world, and it's very much just a part of the whole thing, and uh, it's just beautiful. But I, I remember after it was over, this is years later, I played in Newport, Wales, and it, whenever I'm somewhere, I've played in Newport a lot, I like, I dig Newport, and um, the, they're always nice to me there, all the people that come out, it's a very working class town with a great tradition in the arts, it's a good combination, you know, but, um, I remember uh, whenever I'm somewhere, I will just start Googling, trying to find out, you know, what happened here. Usually something cool happened wherever you're at, and I'll try to find that out. While I'm Googling around, I just happen to find out there's a lot of cool stuff that happened around Newport, and there's all the Joe Strummer stuff, which I knew about, excuse me, I knew about that, but there was also this incident where the Smiths played and, uh, in this venue and they had a riot. It's good to be talking about a riot as the sirens approach, but um, it all, I think maybe, I don't remember what happened, what went down, but the Smiths were done and they weren't gonna come out and play anymore. I think Morrissey was pissed about something. And um, Grant comes out onto the microphone trying to calm the crowd down. Somebody throws a bottle and hits him right in the head. I think it cut him open. And um, so that was that. And Morrissey said, I'll never play in Wales again. And I don't believe he ever has. The Smiths never did. So I was just like, wow, Grant never told me about this. And, um, you know, so many great stories, cool things that happen. I was like, I never, I don't remember ever hearing this. And uh, so I got to looking, I'm like, well, where was that theater at? And I was at a travel lodge at the time, like right downtown's where I was staying and I'm looking and I'm looking and I realize, oh, wow, I'm where that was. They tore down the theater and put up the travel lodge. <laughs> so I'm actually in the space where this happened at that time. It's just a different space now. and. Um, Stuff like that's fun. Stuff like that's fun to just realize how connected so many things are. And I also remember Grant talking about um, the band that he was with. Is it the Here and Now? I feel bad. I don't remember. I don't remember. Um, they played naked at, at uh, Stonehenge. They used to have music festivals at Stonehenge, and um, they decided they were gonna play naked at this festival, and they did it. And um, it's something I would never, ever do. I'm way too uptight and conservative and all of that, but man, to be able to to say, yeah, I played, I played naked at Stonehenge, I don't know. That's the kind of stuff you could put on a I don't know, put on a job resume or something. <laughs> but no, I have beautiful memories of all of that. It's all real positive stuff. And uh, did I see any of you guys at any of those shows? Did I meet you at any of those Billy Grant shows? And uh, I remember Grant telling me that there was a bar I talked about here recently, not recently, but sometime uh, in the channel about where I think the second time I ever saw Justin Towns Earl, I think it was the second time, um, he was playing at the uh, Spencer Stadium Tavern. It's, um, they built the Colt Stadium down the, uh, the street from it, and then I think it got sold or whatever. But um, that's where I met my, that's where I saw David Olney and met Sergio Webb that night, one of my best friends in the world. But like, it's the second time I'd seen Justin the first time was at Bongo Java, and he ran outside afterwards and stopped me because he knew who I was and, and said some nice things. And then I went and saw him at Spencer Stadium Tavern. This is way before his, you know, where he's, his star started rising and uh, before I moved to Nashville. And I watched the show, and then I left, and he ran outside again. I figured he probably didn't remember me from even though he was the one who said hi, he ran outside again and stopped me like, hey, Otis, man, thanks for coming out. And 
which was nice, but that was there. Back to Grant. He said that um, when Morrissey came to Indianapolis, um, they played, I don't remember where they played, but he said that, yeah, I don't want to say too much and get in trouble, so I'm going to edit myself a little bit here. But they all went out and hung out afterwards, and um, uh, they asked somebody where to go, and they sent him to this place, Spencer's Stadium Tavern, which was a cool, fun place to hang out, but it was the last place I would expect them to send Morrissey. It's kind of a sports bar, and um, it was better than a sports bar because they had some music or whatever, but um, it just didn't seem like Morrissey's scene at all. But they went there, and I just thought how strange it would be to walk in there and see Morrissey. And, um, you know, and there's places where I might have sent him other than that, and that's not a slight on that establishment. I would rather hang out there than a whole lot of places where Morrissey would want to hang out, maybe. But um, it just wasn't the same place. But I didn't know any of that. And, and now I'm like friends with this guy and we're in a van and he's telling me about this place where I went and saw people and I went and hung out and Morrissey was there one night and nobody I know even knows that, you know? But a guy in England knows all of this. It was pretty cool. It's a beautiful uh, time and I don't know. But if you saw me or met me on any of those tours, tell me about it down below. I'd love to hear about it. And, um, and I'd love to hear about your, if you have questions, you know, ask me some questions and I'll do my best to answer them. And uh, I will uh, see you somewhere down the road. Much love to you.